thank you everybody for showing up tonight. Uh, I love to talk about my book and uh, I've met so many interesting people since this all began and uh, I've met a lot of people who are descended from home children because as I said earlier, if you caught that, uh, there are approximately 4 million descendants of British home children in Canada now, which is like roughly 10% of Canadians and most of them don't know that they're descended and many, many people have never heard of the British child migration. So um, I'm going to straight sh share my screen. I'm doing a, a sort of a new presentation tonight, so bear with me. Uh, hopefully it works. Because so uh, this is my 15-year-old grandmother. You can see the screen, can you? Yes, we can. Okay, this is my 15-year-old grandmother, Winnie Cooper. Uh, the photograph was taken in uh, June of 1911 at the Children's Village at Barkingside, just outside of London. She had been there at that point for three years. Uh, she was admitted with her two brothers, a younger brother, George, who was nine, and an older brother, Joe, who was 15. Uh, they were, of course, separated right away, and she was sent to the girls' village home uh, because the girls and the boys uh, clearly were not in the same place. So they would have entered in Stepney Causeway, and then they were separated. The boys would have stayed at Stepney Causeway. George was sent to Canada um, within the year. Uh, Joe was never sent to Canada. So um, here is um, a picture of what the children's village looked like. Uh, there were 1,300 girls living there at that time. It was, you can see, very pastoral probably the most beautiful children's home to be for any child to be in at that time. Uh, they had, this is a Bernardo home. Dr. Bernardo realized early on that girls did not adapt well to uh, barracks type of um, housing because many of the girls that came to him were um, very streetwise and uh, they had a very bad influence on those who were not. So he decided that uh, he needed more of a family environment. So um, initially it started out with one section. Uh, he was given some land and uh, eventually by 1902, there were 63 individual homes, all run cottages, all run by, uh, by all run like as a family. So we'd have a house mother and they would do their own cooking and and um, house cleaning and that sort of thing. But there was a school and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit. So uh, anyway, so this all happened in 1911 that uh, Winnie's picture was taken and she was sent to Canada to work as an indentured domestic servant on a Canadian farm. A hundred years later in 2011, I was having a phone conversation with my mother's estranged sister. She lived in Niagara-on-the-Lake and uh, we were talking about, I, I had said, I called her because I wanted to go and visit her and take her out to lunch. And she said, uh, when you come, I want to give you Granny's box. Well, I had seen Granny's box uh, a number of years prior and it just had a few things and like a letter from Bernardo's and some old photographs and things like that. And I, I said, uh, why me? Like, why not, uh, why not one of your own children? And she said, because you'll know what to do with it. So I, I was flattered at that. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but at any rate, uh, I was flattered that she trusted me with it. And we talked a little bit more about the family. And as I say, she was my mother's estranged sister. They had not spoken in 60 years. I didn't meet her when I was a child. I didn't meet her till I was in my thirties at my cousin's wedding. And we immediately hit it off. I had always hoped to broker some kind of uh, reconciliation between them, but my mother had passed away three months prior. And so that had never happened. Uh, so um, I said, uh, we talked a little bit about the family and it seemed like she was starting to open up a bit more about that she was the only one left, the husbands were gone. There didn't seem to be any point in arguing anymore. And uh, I said, well, uh, I'm going to come the following week and take you to lunch and I will call you. Um, I will call you on the weekend and we'll decide on a date. That's when she said she was going to give me the box. So we'd had a conversation during this time and she'd asked me some information about the family that she was not aware of, that I was able to tell her, not really thinking that it would be so upsetting for her as it was. So I could tell she was taken aback. She was shocked with the information I gave her and I uh, hadn't really given up too much thought, as I say, before I, I shared that with her. But uh, anyway, we, we finished off and I said I would call her on the weekend. So that was like maybe on a Thursday, whatever. So uh, 
Sunday, uh, her son called and told me she had suffered an unexpected stroke. And uh, by Tuesday, she passed away. Wow. So I, I never got to have the lunch with her. And uh, I didn't get to have the discussion that I'd hoped to have. However, I did receive the box at her funeral. So I will show you some of the items that were in the box. Uh, photographs, wedding marriage certificate, um, some letters, some documents, and a broken white china doorknob, if you can see that. Uh, not quite sure why she kept that, but I thought it has to have a story. So and it has been, uh, it had been repaired with um, transparent carpenter's glue. So here's a second picture of these items. Uh, this is her Bible and it's open at the 23rd Psalm and these items appeared, were tucked into the Bible at that point. So obviously something uh, strategic there. So moving on, uh, I'm just going to give you a short uh, uh, pricey of Winnie's journey. So this is Scarborough. Uh, this is the South Bay of Scarborough. It's a beautiful village, uh, town, I guess. Famous for Scarborough Fair, which actually hasn't happened in a very long time. Also famous for the spa waters. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a resort town, so people would go and, and, and enjoy the spa waters and hope to get cured there. Uh, Anne Bronte actually went there when she had tuberculosis, hoping to become cured, but she did not survive and is buried at St. Mary's Church. So that large building you see in the front is the Grand Hotel, which was very famous. <laughs> when it was built, uh, I think like something like 1897, uh, it was the largest hotel in Europe and the largest uh, brick building in Europe. Uh, so this is South Bay. That big uh, hill in the back is the promontory, which divides the two bays. On the other side is North Bay, which is equally as large. On top are the, uh, the ruins of Scarborough Castle. So the view from that point uh, looks right across the Baltic. So it was a very strategic location, which actually figures into the book later on. So this is where Winnie started. She probably lived, I don't know, can you see my cursor? So she probably lived in about this area here, which is um, Old Town, where the uh, the fishing area was. Um, so when I went over there, I was able to walk that area and the narrow laneways where she probably had her home. From there, she went to a Stepney Causeway. So this is the entrance to Dr. Bernardo's homes in Stepney Causeway, where all the children would enter there, where they would be photographed and measured and weighed and all of the other things. And then the girls and boys would be separated and the girls would be sent to the girls' home. So if you can see here, uh, at the bottom, it says no destitute child ever refused admittance. Uh, this happened, uh, I don't know exactly what year this was taken. I'm gonna guess this picture is somewhere around uh, eight, late 1890s. Uh, 7,000 children are at this point in the care of Bernardo's. So there was an, uh, when Dr. Bernardo um, was, uh, came from Dublin and he went to London to study medicine, he wanted to be a medical missionary in China. And while he was there, uh, he began to learn about all these boys that were living on the street. And so he started taking them in. It's a long story, but I'm gonna make it really short. He uh, started taking boys home. He would go out at night and find boys on the street. Uh, he could only take boys home because he was single. Uh, and then there was one evening when he went out, he had room for five more children and he found five boys. There was another little boy whose name was uh, John um, Somerville, I believe. And uh, his nickname was Kurtz because he had red hair. And he asked to go with him. And Dr. Bernardo said, I have no more room tonight, but uh, to not, tomorrow night you can come. So in the night, Carrots died from exposure. And, uh, and um, there was actually an autopsy done on Carrots because there was some history known with, uh, known with this boy. His mother had turned him out when he was seven. And uh, he, he was malnourished and he suffered from exposure. So at that point, uh, Dr. Bernardo actually never got over the guilt of turning this child away. And he decided that no destitute child would ever be refused admittance. And he also uh, started building ever open door homes, they were called in satellite homes in various cities all around 
uh, in England, Scotland, and Wales, because he realized that there were children elsewhere besides in London that needed help. This is Winnie's uh, picture when she entered the home. You can see she looks quite different. Uh, fright. All the children had their hair uh, cut very close because they all had uh, they all had lice. All the children entering entering it was just common practice. Uh, I didn't put this picture on the front of the book because I thought that people would immediately think this is a tragic book. I don't want to read it, uh, and it's not a tragic book because even though many of these children were treated very very poorly. Um, abused, neglected, whatever. This was not the case for Winnie, and she did actually thrive in her environment there. This is George. Uh, he is nine years old here, and this is his entry picture. We don't have a picture of Joe, although I have since found Joe's uh, grandson, also living in Wales, uh, the next village over from my cousin Myra, though so the family didn't move far. So this is a, a, an aerial view of the children's village. And I, I figured out that I'm quite certain this picture was taken in June of 1908 when he would have been there because there are guests there and the, the, the viewpoint would have been the steeple of the church. So there are three greens in this uh, space. There's 63 cottages. Uh, straight ahead there is what's called Karen's house, which was named after the original governor of the homes. And I, I never really found a description of what the purpose of Karen's house was, but I have a feeling that it was administrative. So there's a lot of guests moving through. I can see some tables set up for refreshments and things. Off in the far uh, right upper corner, there is a large tent. So this is why I believe this was in June, 1908. Every year in June, they would have uh, the Founders Day celebration, which was to celebrate Dr. Bernardo's birthday. And it was to invite all the old boys and old girls to come back to the villages. And all of the Bernardo children would be taken by train to the girls' village home uh, for these celebrations. As well, um, invited guests came and the royal patron who at that particular time was the Duck Duchess of Albany the widow of um, Queen Victoria's son. Uh, so she would have been there because on this occasion, Dr. Bernardo had actually passed away three years earlier and they were dedicating a monument to him. So when he was there at that time, and hopefully she might've got to see George because and Joe because they would have been taken there by train for the event. So I'm gonna show you another perspective there. This is from the opposite side. So straight ahead, for the back, you can see the church. Uh, so this is the other end. You can see the, the large green in the center is where that tent was located. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see the hospital. There's three different wings. They would have read a regular medical wing, an infectious disease wing, and a tuberculosis wing. So the cottages uh, housed between, they were built over a period of 20 years, and they house anywhere between 16 and 25 girls with a house mother. Uh, they had a school and uh, the children's church, which was the only children's church in the British Commonwealth, uh, in that the pews were all custom made to accommodate the children, and it did accommodate 1,300 girls. So all around, you can see um, you can see the fields. It was it was outside of London. I've been there. It's actually quite well within London now, but at that time it was outside. Here's a monument, very large. With benches all around, and this is where Dr. Bernardo is uh, is interred. His, I think it's his ashes interred there. Here's a picture of Dr. Bernardo at the home. He was very proud of the girls' village home. It was his dream to build a, a home for girls because for a number of years he was only able to rescue boys because he was unmarried. So he began to realize that he needed, in order to rescue girls, he had to find a wife. So he was very fortunate to find um, a woman who uh, was of like mind to him, uh, Siri Louise Elmsley. And she actually wrote a book. This is her book, which is actually um, uh, Dr. Bernardo's memoir. So it's, it's, it's basically, uh, there is uh, her interpretation of what was going on, but it's actually from his journal. So this is a reproduction of that book. I don't know when the original was made, but I was able to get this online. Uh, this is George. One year later, if you can remember the first picture, you can see the difference of George's appearance in one year and how he 
blossomed under the care of Bernardo Holmes. This is when he was sent to Canada. So it's February 9th uh, and uh, let me see, yeah, February 9th. And um, that's when he was sent. Uh, this is this group of girls uh, came around the time when he came. I don't know that she's in this group. It was somewhere around 1910 or 1911. But I wanted to show it because it gives you an example of uh, or a sort of a visual of the size of the groups of girls that would come a couple of times a year. And you can see if you look in the front row that some of them are quite tiny. So uh, these little ones. This picture is actually taken in front of Karen's house, that building that I spoke about. The younger ones that were too young to work, which would, would have been anybody under the age of 10 or mostly under the age of 10, they were actually put into, they, they would have gone to the girl's home, which we're going to see in a minute, or they would have gone into foster care. And Dr. Bernardo was one of the first people to ever put children in foster care, but it didn't work in, in Britain, but it did work in Canada. Um, and uh, it worked quite successfully. The only issue was that the children were actually sent, uh, even though this was intended to be to their benefit, they were a commodity. And uh, when they reached age 10, they had to leave those families and go and go to work to a farm family. And there was a huge demand for these children. And there were never enough children to satisfy that demand. This is Hazel Bray, where the girls went when they uh, where they stayed when they came to Canada. And typically, as I say, the demand was greater than the supply. And uh, so typically girls like Winnie would have just come here, sort of um, got stabilized and, you know, got over the trip and then would have been sent off right away to the family that she was to go to. And for Winnie, it was a family, um, a, a nice, a nice family, actually. This is this was her next stop which is Hillsburg Station in Erin Township, Ontario, where she went to the home of Harry and Kate Hall. They had three little boys under the age of three, and uh, it was her job to be a mother's helper and um, look after these three little boys and do everything else that a woman has to do on a farm. So this is John, my grandfather, and he was also a Bernardo boy. Uh, he is 13 in this picture, although he only looks like he's about nine or 10. Uh, so he went into care in uh, uh, June of 1904. Uh, and he pretty much was turned around. There's only one photograph of him because he would have left uh, right away, uh, very, very quickly. Within about three months, he was sent to Canada because he was the right age. So there were two pictures taken when the children stayed, you know, for more than a year. But uh, Less than that, um, they would have just been the one picture. So this is a very famous uh, political cartoon called Our Gutter Children. Uh, the, the artist is George Carruthers. He was very well known for doing this sort of thing. It's a satirical cartoon. Uh, these people are sweeping the streets of the little girls. They're dumping them into the mud cart. The woman on the right-hand side with the whip is Maria Rye. She was the first person to send children to Canada under the plan, which actually began in uh, 1869. Dr. Bernardo did not send children for quite some time after that, and she was the person who influenced him to do so. He actually did not want to send the children. He took a very close interest in all of them, but he finally realized that uh, an open front door needed an open back door because he could not possibly accommodate all the children that were coming his way. And by the time he passed away in 1905, he had 8,700 children in his care in Britain, not including the ones that were in Canada. So she is actually uh, thanking these people for helping her uh, clean up the, the refuse on the street and um, uh, send all of these, uh, these children far away, taking them to the dock, sending them far, far away, where they will have a better life, many, many miles from the from the loved ones in Canada, who whom they will never, or their loved ones in, in England, whom they will never see again. And the man in the center is um, actually a clergyman, and he is saying, um, I think I can actually read this, according to the teach teachings of Jesus, uh, all these little gutter children, um, uh, it is my it's my duty to to help uh, this Christian ministry to uh, um, to help this woman with her good work, uh, and the other two people are helping. 
In the background, you can see the, um, the advertisements for Brandy Roman beer because uh, George Carruthers, like many people at that time, blamed uh, alcoholism for the poverty um, and, and the disease that went on. It was a very strong temperance movement then. This is another picture of Stepney Causeway, just to sort of give you the idea. It's a connection of uh, houses that one by one Dr. Bernardo was able to acquire with the assistance of the patrons that he had that helped him out. Uh, his main patron was uh, Lord Shaftesbury. Uh, he had somehow, um, I think I said uh, earlier that he had gone to London to study medicine and then got distracted by this poverty. And so we made some friends along the way and he did a lot of preaching about temperance. And so the local people actually liked him because he was quite charming and they would actually listen to his preaching. And uh, so he happened to meet Lord Shaft uh, Shaftesbury's daughter and um, she would occasionally invite him for tea at which time one of those occasions he met her brother. And um, so he was very interested in what was going on. He was a bit of a philanthropist and he invited him to come for dinner one night while some of his men friends were there so they could talk about his work. So he did that and uh, he was quite comfortable with uh, preaching in the streets as he was in being in uh, drawing rooms and asking for money. But at this point on that first night, he was not asking for money. They, were at, they asked him about what he had seen on the streets and about the children and uh, they asked him if he could show them. So after dinner, he said yes. So they ordered some handsome cabs or whatever they call them. Uh, they went down to the docks and um, there were no children to be seen, but uh, there was a lot of freight sitting around waiting for the barges to come in the next day. They were covered in tarps. And so he got down on the ground. He reached up into under, underneath one of the tarps, tarps and he grabbed hold of a foot and dragged a boy out onto the street. And he said, uh, he said, if I give you sixpence, will you get the rest of them out? So the boy, of course, gladly took the sixpence, climbed up on top, stomped around on the on the uh, top of the tarpaulin and 73 boys came tumbling out from underneath. So the, the uh, Lord Shaftesbury and his friends were so astounded that they went back to their home and they started giving him money. And so every time he got money, he um, bought another house and uh, he was always lived, he always redlining it. Uh, but it seemed that whenever he totally ran out of money, some miracle happened and more would come his way. So here's an example of the boys. And um, this again is at the girls village home. So um, I'm going to guess that this is one of those occasions uh, of, of the uh, Founders Day celebration. And they gathered, the, all the boys have come for the celebration. And they these would be, be the boys from um, Stephanie Causeway. So they've gathered them all together for a photograph just of the boys. It's just an opportunity for you to get a feeling about the numbers of these kids. This is a picture of just a random photograph of the children that entered uh, Stepney Causeway in one day. So this was a typical day. These are postcards, which Dr. Bernardo had printed up, which he would sell. And um, to raise, one of the ways he raised money uh, and people would buy them for a couple of pence, whatever. He got into a great deal of trouble for doing these because, uh, and he was in trouble more than once. Um, these photographs were staged. This little boy uh, did not come in dressed as he is on the picture on the left. Uh, he looked more like he does on the right where he's actually working, but they, they found some rags, they dressed him up and they did this quite a bit and then they sold the pictures. But when it was discovered that these pictures were fake, um, Dr. Bernardo had to, um, had to stop doing this. He was also, uh, he was in court a few times. Uh, sometimes for taking children and not returning them. Their parents maybe went after them, wanted the kids back. Uh, these children came from various places. They didn't all come from the street. Sometimes the parents surrendered them, thinking that they needed, saying that they needed a little bit of help for a few months. Someone was ill. Uh, could you take our children for, you know, a few months until we're back on our feet? And then in the meantime, when they would come back to get the children, they would be already gone. So some parents were able to challenge that 
And uh, so Dr. Bernardo got in a bit of trouble for that. Plus, he was very much an evangelist, and he figured any children that came in who were Catholic or any other religion, um, it was his duty to rescue them and not to let them fall back into Catholic hands. So sometimes they would just sort of vanish into a foreign country very quickly. Here's a picture of Dr. Bernardo and his wife, uh, Siri. Uh, one thing about him that it was problematic for most of the homes back then, they didn't know what to do with the um, handicapped or disabled or developmentally delayed children. Uh, and Dr. Bernardo took all of these children in and created spaces for them. Uh, some of the children lived right in the village, uh, in the homes, uh, the ones that were able to cope. And if they if they weren't able to cope, then they would um, they would put uh, they would go to maybe another location where they had better facilities but um it was his um dream that wherever possible these children would learn skills and the girls and and some of them were you know, some of the the girls were blind or deaf or or both and so they were taught needlework and they did find that many of them adapted very well to the needlework and they were able to, to get employment because he always worried about what happens to these children when they're 18 and i have to turn them out which was another good reason for sending them off to Canada. So, and also Canada wasn't the only country. The children were sent to uh, all the colonies, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Rhodesia. So the reason I mentioned the handicapped children is the little girl there is his daughter. And uh, I've forgotten her name now, but um, so uh, she's de developmentally delayed. I think he had about seven children. And of course, she was raised in his family with uh, with his other children. Um, his one daughter, Maud Siri, actually married Somerset Maud. So anyway, his wife Siri was a very big influence on him, and uh, carried on his work after he passed away in 1905. Um, and the year that I think it was the year that I went over there to England um, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Bernardo's. Uh, a rose was dedicated to her and it was called the Sweet Siri Rose. And I have a picture of it here. Um, so that's kind of the most important things about uh, Dr. Bernardo. Uh, he was the person that, of course, because my grandmother was a Bernardo child and because he sent most of the children to Canada, about 40,000 came through Bernardo Homes. Uh, but Many of the other organizations, as I said, were not so well organized, uh, were not um, so well disciplined. Uh, Bernardo's did send um, inspectors out to the farms to visit the children, but it wasn't consistent in that um, the children were you know, spread far and wide. It wasn't easy to travel. Oftentimes when the inspector would get there, the child would be out in the field and the farmer would say, oh, you know, he's a great kid, no problem. But that might not have been the case. Many times the children were not well treated and uh, they would run away. Sometimes uh, there were suicides, there were two murders. Uh, they were, they were both, one of them was, was called a suicide, but it clearly was not. Uh, the other one, the woman went to trial, um, but she was not convicted. Uh, she, the, the child was beaten to death and her reasoning was that um, he was a lazy lout. Uh, there's a couple of other things I was gonna tell you about. Um, so, in speaking like of Maria Rye, she was one of the first ones and she encouraged Dr. Bernardo to send children to Canada. And uh, in his defense, he actually came to Canada three times to, uh, to and, he, and he stayed for some time and traveled to all of the homes that he had here and met many of the children to make sure that things were being done the way he wanted. Uh, prior to his sending children, um, the British government, one of the uh, local um, uh, British uh, offices, I can't really recall, it would have been like a welfare office, sent a man named Andrew Doyle to Canada because there was a lot of, a lot of conflict about what was going on here. So he was sent here to do, uh, to do um, 
some research and find out if the children were being well cared for. And when he went back, his report was scathing and that oftentimes the children were just uh, picked up and nobody was taking any account of who was taking them. And one of the worst person or people in that respect was Maria Rye. And uh, so when she was called up um, to explain how um, a 12 year old child and her care became pregnant, she said her answer was, that's what you get when you uh, when you take in street children, street Arabs, actually, she said. So the children were not well received here uh, in Peterborough at Hazel Bray. That particular town was very welcoming and that Hazel Bray house was donated to Bernardo's. But uh, on the on the whole, they were not well treated. And um, here's an example. Uh, from the 1891 edition of the Canadian Manufacturer and Industrial World magazine, published by the Honorable Frederick Nichols, stated that these waifs and strays are tainted and corrupt with moral slime and filth inherited from parents and surroundings of the most foul and disgusting character. And all the washing and clean clothes that Dr. Bernardo may bestow, bestow a cannot possibly remove. There is no power whatever that can cleanse the lepers so that they fit they are fit to become desirable citizens of Canada. Um, and there's another quotation up here from Member of Parliament, Dr. Peter McDonald, who spoke against the government subsidies for immigration of, of home children. And he finished up by saying um, that these children, he said, uh, no such $2 a head should be paid by the government to bring such refuse of the old country civilization to pour it here among our people. We take more and uh, we take more means to purify our cattle. So that was sort of the general feeling of, uh, of city Canadians, um, not understanding that without these children, the farmers didn't have anybody to help them on the farms and the people in the cities were clearly eating the food. Uh, there was at that time during the, eight, the late 1800s, uh, uh, a Canadian eugenics society in Toronto, which was quite active, organized by a, a group of doctors and politicians and that, that were very adamant about the, the home children not being here. And Dr. Bernardo Holmes was called forth uh, with regards to uh, 124 girls who had had uh, babies, uh, come from Bernardo's, had babies at Toronto General Hospital. And uh, he was accused of contaminating the uh, pure Canadian gene pool. There, he did have a receiving home in Toronto. And in the 1901 census, um, I think it was 1901, there were seven girls between the ages of 15 and 22 living in that home. So uh, this was a problem with, uh, obviously, with sexual abuse with, with the children. And no one was accountable for it at the time. Um, they did have the home there, as I said, uh, in Toronto for these girls. Sort of the, she go back, um, I guess maybe 50 years to sort of figure out why this all came about, really had to do with uh, the socioeconomic conditions in Britain uh, at the beginning of the 1800s when um, the, the um, feudal system started to collapse because of the, uh, the development of machinery and people moving to the city, the farmers started to have uh, tractors and they didn't need so many people. They were pushed off the farms. They went to the cities where they could work in mills. Um, they were poor. There were more and more children. Uh, and so this was sort of the beginning of it. So between 1801 and 1901 census, the population in England and Wales grew from about eight and a half million to 32 million, which was a huge jump. The first census to analyze demographics in 1841, uh, they found that 45% of the population was under the age of 20. So when you consider that there was probably a, a significant group of the aristocracy that didn't work at all, it left a small number of people to actually support the population. So you can see where this all came from. So I will stop my screen share now. I wanted you to get a good picture of the sweet Siri Rose because it's awfully pretty. And uh, yeah, we're back. So questions.
Looking for more great content like this? Why not check out the Oakville Historical Society's website, YouTube channel, or Facebook and Instagram pages.